growth for their own companies. So thanks for, uh, for being on the set with us today, Khalid. Go ahead and give you a little introduction of yourself before we jump in. Sure, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, name is Khalid Saleh. Uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of Invesp. Um, we are a conversion rate optimization company. Uh, been doing it since 2006. Um, that uh, I always joke that for the first eight months of the company's life, it was not even called conversion rate optimization. Uh, it was merely called improving website conversion rates. And then the Eisenberg brothers invented the name and we were at the conference. And I'm like, oh, so that's what we do. Um, over the years, we've worked with companies, both large and small. Um, on the large side, we've worked with eBay, 3M, Special Olympics, Target. Uh, but a good chunk of our clients are kind of on the smaller side, the SMB, small to medium-sized businesses, and based in Chicago. So finally, we're enjoying some good weather. Yes. Oh, my gosh. We were just telling one of our other clients today, they're out in California, and uh, they kind of make fun of us because nine months out of the year, Chicago has, you know, pretty terrible weather. But we're like, no, this is it. This is peak for us. So, yeah, we can, we can talk about Chicago all the time, but Chicago in the summer... You know, that's why we all stay. <laughs> although, although it's funny, I have to say, so we put up with a just horrible, horrible weather. And don't get me started on that because then we'll turn the, <laughs> the whole weather. The whole weather. About that. Yes. But then like, you know, like it's it, last weekend, it just rained and rained. I'm like, come on, you know, I'm putting yeah. up with all this bad weather so I can, can get three months a year where it's nice weather and now it's raining. But, yeah. uh, you know, today, today was nice. So I'm not complaining. So. Yeah, no, exactly. It's a perfect day to be downtown, but, uh, you know, we are, we are, it looks like you're in your home office as well, in a home studio. That's where I am too. So the remote life works. Oh, it? definitely. Definitely. Although I, ha I have to say like, you know, so we've been remote now for about a year and a half and I'm starting to get worried about our team members because when you're constantly work, you know, when, when you have an office, there's this separation I come to work and I'm done with work, you know, nine to yep. six, whatever it might be, 10 to seven. But now I just feel that the team is constantly working and I'm like, okay, some of them are just getting burnt out. And I'm like, you know what? You got to take some time off, a couple of weeks, go away, you know, refresh, come back because- uh, Get out. So, yep. <laughs> no, I mean, it's so important. Have you guys always been remote or was that a recent change given everything? Mm -hmm. No, we've been semi-remote since uh, since we've created the company. But uh, it's sort sure. of funny because I signed a, I signed a new office contract March oh, 15, no. 2020. So I, I do my job trying to support different landlords around the world by paying for different offices that we don't use at all. So March 15th, that's like the week yes. before. Oh, my gosh. We literally and looked at, uh, like moved like you know, all of the desks and everything. And I think we'll be in that office for about a week or maybe two weeks. That's it. Man. So. Well, at least you guys would be in there for that little bit, right? I know yeah. it definitely wasn't uh, wasn't planned for anybody, but it is kind of funny how, you know, especially for us at Visual says, you know, we're a digital marketing company too. We've always been semi-remote, always had the ability to log on from wherever. And we felt, obviously the pandemic was hard on everyone, but we felt especially equipped you know, just to have all of the communication channels already in place, just to be able to have Slack already on board, you know, any, anywhere, any time zone. It's, uh, it was definitely a blessing for us to set up the tech in a way that was accessible. Hopefully that accessibility stays. You know, we're, we were here, we're here to talk about conversion rate optimization, which like you said, in the old days, used to just mean sales. <laughs> um, but, you know, in terms of accessibility and making sure that things are uh, accessed from from all remote points you know that's a part of conversion rate optimization and seo at least which uh kind of brings me around circle you know my, my background just to give a little bit of background that visual says we're obviously a, a digital marketing agency here in chicago and you're you're here in chicago as well so that's where we're similar first off uh, but visual says you know we offer um seo paid search sem and then web dev and web support around those things all centered around branding and conversion rate optimization touches every single one of the services that we offer, you know, in, indirectly, directly, whatever it is, conversion rate optimization, it's really what we're here for in marketing. In, in a way, they, they can be synonymous, they can be totally, you know, niche and different from themselves. So I definitely have tons of questions for why conversion rate would be important for any, any company. I'm sure you get asked that quite a bit. 
So hopefully we can get into some of the, uh, excuse the phrase, the meatier bits of <laughs> conversion rate optimization. Sure. Cool, so for anybody uh, just joining us, want to reintroduce us, this is the Visual Fit Growth Series. We have Khalid Salah, did I, Khalid Salah, exactly. You got right. it right, yeah, Khalid Salah. Awesome, okay. I can barely pronounce the words that we normally work with, so I'm very glad to hear the pronunciation. DJ Khalid. <laughs> Okay. No goodness. It's uh it's it's your mic and your music production level microphone that got me excited. There you so. go. There you go. So I'll 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 share a funny story and then we can jump in. So I, I tried to be on Snapchat a couple of years ago and it's just not for me. But <laughs> tried. <laughs> overnight I get I think about two thousand followers. I'm like, well, you know, maybe all these silly videos I've been doing are actually succeeding. Maybe I'm doing something smart. So being like, you know, the good marketer, I'm like, let me, let me stop following them back. And I follow the first person back and right away a message pops up and it's this high school girl. It's like, I can't believe you followed me. And I'm like, okay. Oh no. Nothing interesting about what I say, you know, for a high school girl. So I'm like, stop following people. Look into why you got 2000 followers. And I look. And somebody had posted basically the Snapchats of all these f famous DJs and musicians. And for DJ Khaled, uh, that person decided to put my Snapchat ID. Sure. Thus, I had the 2,000 followers. And that was the last time I used Snapchat. I never logged into it. And I thought, like, you know what? I'm not going to disappoint people, you know, but probably not for me, so. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. It's the reason that I even kind of made that call out. I, uh, if it looks like I'm looking off to the side, I, I'm taking notes on what we're talking about using a handy dandy actual pencil to write on a piece of paper. But I wrote, you know, branding and the word college and how, you know, the, the kind of implications around the branding there. Maybe we can, we could revisit that. So it's funny that you bring that up because obviously um, keyword research is critical, you know, for a social media strategy. <laughs> cool. So let's let's hop right in with with kind of uh, uh, what you do. At, will you say the brand name again? Invest P. Invest. I know that I. It's invest. invest. So uh, going okay. back to branding, uh, people always struggle with the name, uh, and it used to stand for something. I actually just remember the V stood for virtual. I don't remember even mm. the rest stood for. So I always joke with people because they always struggle with the name. And I tell them, we have a knack for coming up with weird names at Invesp. It is strange, but you'll remember it. And they're like, oh yeah, I will remember Invesp, Invesp. Because lots of times, even on a phone call, they're like, hey, you guys from Invest. I'm like, no, Invesp. They're like, yeah. I'm like, it's Invesp with a P, not with a T. So. Yeah. Well, hey, I mean, they, uh, the, the memory part of it, it does matter. You know, obviously they have to have that conversation with you and then you can correct them and that's in there forever. Yep. Love it. There's deep psychology involved in this. And that was your intention in picking <laughs> the name, all right? Along, all along, you know? <laughs> uh, you said that it, it stood for virtual. Is that, you know, the, a key the component? stood for virtual. I don't even know what the rest stood for. Uh, it, it was actually, it's, it's um, me and my wife who started the company. She started it. And then I joined her. Lots of times people assume they're like, oh, you're the CEO. You started the company. I'm like, no, actually, my wife started it. I was a software architect uh, in a different life. Um, and it started as something really small on the side. And uh, two years later, I, I still remember her. Um, I was working on a project for GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar, the competitor of Zoom. Zoom didn't even exist at that point in time. But my wife knocks on my door. I'm working on, like, on this project. And she's like, I think you should quit your job. And I'm like, quit my job. I mean, wow. you know, stable salary, you know, software architect. She's like, I think, I think I'm onto something over here. Um, so... About half an hour later, I was on a call with my boss and I told him, I'm like, hey, Bill, I think I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, I'm wow. gonna quit. Um, and it's funny because my parents were visiting at that point in time. So I, so I quit my job. I go downstairs. I sit with my parents. They're like, hey, how are you doing? How's your day? I'm like, yeah, I just quit my job. And they're like, what? What happened <laughs> to you? <laughs> and I'm like, well, we have this like, you know, thing that we're doing now. And they're like, I, can't. I think my mom had a heart attack. She's like, you have such a good job and a good salary. And, you know, the rest is history. I always joke with her. I'm like, mom, remember that? She's like, no, I don't. I never said that. I'm like, yes, you did. <laughs> I thought it was crazy. What? <laughs> So I, there's a lot of things that I just heard from that story, but, you know, just <laughs> casually quitting your job, it, it reminds me of overnight successes take years to build. It sounds like you may have had a plan in place before you took that jump. Is that the case? Or no. did you quit and then build? 
Oh, okay, so, okay. <laughs> I, I wish we had a plan because, uh, so I quit my job in March and, you know, we have money saved up, but I, and then my wife, like, you know, thought that the business was a bit more stable than uh, the business was actually, uh, than uh, compared to what the business was, uh, was actually at the stage it was at. Uh, <clears throat> so we survived until August. And then I'm like, oh gosh, what have I done? There's not enough business coming through. It's not the same stable salary with at the end of the month, you're getting a really nice paycheck. Um, so we scrambled for a little bit and somehow things tended to work themselves out throughout the years. Not something that I would buy, uh, advise anybody to do, um, mm -hmm. but you know, somehow like, you know, so I, I remember like you know, sometimes at the end of the month, especially the early years, I'm like, oh man, are we gonna be able to pay for the office rent? And like, you know, we've had a couple of employees, are we gonna be able to pay for them? And somehow, like, you know, you always had something new come up and business expanded. It, of course, helped that we were very early at the game. So not too many companies yeah. were doing conversion optimization, a lot less competition. So, Yeah, that was actually going to be a, a couple points that I just wrote down while we were talking. Uh, in my past life, I started out freelancing, you know, probably around 2011 when I was still kind of in college right towards the end there. And that's when it was pretty new, like there were contractors and people did offer this, but it wasn't the Upworks. It wasn't the freelancer.com. It wasn't the huge movement that it is now. And definitely there's not as many competitors in the space. There's not as many people offering this exact niche. SEO is kind of in the same way where it tends to fall under marketing than anything else, much the same way conversion rate optimization, you know, it, it tends to fall under marketing and marketers have to be like, hey, this is important, please, can we focus on it? You know, but it, it does fall out under those umbrellas. So I'm kind of curious how, you know, being in the conversion rate optimization business, you know, you just started your business, you're kicking things off. How do you generate the clients that you would actually serve? Obviously that, uh, that conversion rate process gets optimized, but I'd love to hear where you started. Oh, oh gosh. Uh, it's sort of sort of interesting because initially it was just a couple of contacts here and there. Um, and one thing that we've relied on in the early days is just talking to our clients. And yeah. until now, clients represent a good, we've had clients since 2010 that, that refer business to us. So if you're able, I would say the secret to a good relationship to a successful digital marketing project, two, two things, you got to deliver good results. Uh, which the client can see because you can deliver the most amazing results, but if the client doesn't see them, it's useless. Um, and then number two, you got to keep amazing relationship. Um, good results, no relationship dies. Uh, you know, amazing relationship, but there's no results. The client's going to say, hey, why am I paying for this? So you do those two things and not, you know, the client keeps you around for a long, long time, but they're also willing to refer business to you. So that was how it was early on. Um, one of the things that helped us tremendously, our first blog post was August 2006. So we've been writing content about conversion optimization you know, for, for years now. So the website has very healthy traffic. We're at about 100,000 visitors a month. Um, and then in the space, I think nice. there's only one other website that kind of does better in traffic than us. So we've established ourselves in that, in that area. And, and we're at a point where almost every day there's two, three companies that reach out to us and say, hey, you know, we're interested in doing conversion optimization. Can you guys help us out? So awesome. uh, I would say like, you know, I was when people ask me, I'm like, you know, content is good. I don't know if content, if, if a digital marketing agency is doing, let's say they, they want to do something right now. I don't know if content would work as well for them because you're competing against very well established brands. I can like, you know, it's the start of the quarter. And I sit with our marketing team and I say, okay, well, here are the keywords that we want to rank for. We have those you know, five or six terms that we're going after. And I know if we publish enough content by the end of the quarter, we'll be on the first page, probably one of the top three or five results. Well, that's Are you talking about, is. sorry to interrupt you, are you talking about written blog content? Written blog content, um, you know, because again, like, you know, when you have a domain with 200,000, you know, backlinks, we, we structure it a little bit. We have enough contacts. We can push our domain. But let's say somebody, a digital agency owner is just starting out. It's, it's tough. Now, if you're doing something local, you can actually compete and you can still, you can still rank. And, you know, if, if I'm focused on something, you know, in Philadelphia or something like that, yeah, you can, you can do really am, amazingly well there. Yeah, I mean, definitely content is, is key. Content is king. Uh, and content covers a lot of different bases. You know, obviously, if we're just talking about written blog content, it can be really tough to rank against, you know, 
if you're a DIY company and you want to rank against Home Depot, that's going to be very, very tough, you know, if you're just starting out. But if you are a DIY company and you're trying to rank against competitors right in your size, right where it fits, you know, then creating content that fits that audience and, and brings value is important. So the diversification of content is something that we emphasize on, you know, there's blog content, and then there's video content, and then there's images, and then there's, you know, interviews, and then there's all of these different things, and they all fall under content. Uh, something else that I definitely wanted to call out and bring up, you know, we talk about content, we talk about content writing, we talk about content writing for growth. Mm -hmm. What this means in terms of content writing, what, what is content? It's expertise. You are taking expertise from your brain and you're putting it onto something, you know, a piece of paper, a video, whatever it is, you're proving to the world that you know what you're talking about. So that's, you know, kind of a pretty key element that might fall between the cracks, I feel, in the growth process, create content now what it's it's you know you you use it to to share your expertise in, in whatever it is that you know yeah and i think also another another thing that lots of marketing you know lots of marketers continue emphasizing content marketing as a way and i i believe i believe it's, it's i mean for us it's been taking our business from you know oh we're just starting out and to like very being fairly successful um, but I also think lots of marketers, when they talk about content marketing, they talk about content creation. You can write blog posts, you can create videos, you can do podcasts, but um, if you cannot figure out a way to have eyeballs to see though that, that content piece, if you don't have an actual content distribution plan, well, your content is going to sit there. Uh, you might be under the mercy of Google and Google changes the algorithm and one day you're doing really well, another day you're not doing so well. So what I always ask our team, I'm like, okay, so what's our distribution plan? You, you wrote a blog post for us, could be 4,000, 5,000 words. It's, it takes us almost a week to create and research and make sure that we're interviewing lots of people. I'm like, okay, so if you just put 40 to 60 hours into creating a blog post, mm -hmm. how do we make sure, I mean, we, when we have our email list, but how do we make sure that more and more people are seeing it? What is the distribution plan? Um, because that's that's important. And then what's the goal from the content piece? Is it top of the funnel? Is mid funnel? Is bottom of the funnel? How do we actually make sure that this gets to the right audience at the right stage? And what's the action that we're expecting them to take from it? So everything that you just highlighted is basically the process. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I'm sure you will. Uh, if if that's the process for conversion rate optimization, you know, you create pieces of content directly for that audience. You get it in the eyes of the people that care about it. And then you learn from what happens. Uh, so yeah, I mean, exactly what you highlighted for content, we can apply that to, to conversion rate optimization. You know, we're definitely talking about growth, you know, on the growth series and, and content really is the footsteps, you know, to, to climb that ladder. So I think it absolutely makes sense that, you know, if you guys started blog writing in 2006 and you've been sharing your expertise ever since, You've built up a brand around that reputation. You know, you've given the audience, yes, I know what I'm talking about. Here's the proof of it. Here's all of the proof of all of the supporting things as well. It really is creating a brand around the expertise. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's sort of interesting as, as we go through these exercises, usually with, with the internal team of creating content. And one of the things that hit us a while back, that's, hey, listen, if you ask digital marketers and people, especially in the space, I'm like, okay, so, hey, how can I find out a good course on conversion rate optimization? How do I find out? How do I calculate, like, you know, what statistics I need to use when I'm doing A-B testing? They'll, they'll point out to our content. But I told them, and this is great. I'm not complaining. However, my end customer, the companies that we work with us, is typically a VP of e-commerce or a CEO at a, at a company. I don't think he's searching for A-B testing statistics you know, they're not interested True. in that. So I always tell them like, it's fine. Like, you know, we want the digital marketers, the advanced marketers to read our content, but we also have to create that content that appeals to our target audience. And when we did that shift where we're, we're still doing, doing a mix between here's the how to, you know, lengthy blog posts, but we're also doing content that's targeted towards the right audience, the audience that actually ends up hiring us that also helped us really, we, we saw a shift in the number of leads that are coming to us and companies want to talk, to talk to us. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, that shift in thinking really does change the content that you bring to the table too. You know, if you're not just trying to put words together onto a page, if you're actually trying to 
speak to somebody and get them to take an action or prove the value of what you're offering, you know, that changes the, the content you're writing, much less about just creating it for the sake of it and much more to, to put it to work. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, uh, so a couple questions that come to mind. What are some of your favorite distribution channels for you know, the, the content strategies that you put into place? Mm -hmm. I know so, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it depends on the piece of content, um, but for us, because again, we're, we're a B2B, so our target audience is, again, CMOs, VPs of marketing. Uh, so LinkedIn does really well for us. Um, and it's funny because I tell people I've been on LinkedIn since 2007, <laughs> but I've been on LinkedIn only since 2020, January, 2020 for a long time. I've been on LinkedIn and just on the con. So you post something and it feels like you're, you know, you're, you're shouting into the void or you're going into a skyscraper. Ether. Yeah. You just open a window at a big skyscraper, you shout something, no one <laughs> hears you. And it's like, nothing happened. Didn't, uh, I tell my wife, can you like my post? <laughs> just like, <laughs> oh. she likes it. I'm like, oh, that feels sad and lonely. Um, I think 2020 <laughs> is when we took LinkedIn very seriously and it really helped even push us further. Um, social media in general, um, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, now I'm on a, on a mission to figure out Twitter and I think I, I have most of it figured out. So <laughs> we'll see, like, you know, we, should, we should talk in six months to see if I also managed to crack that nut. We should um, run that as an A-B test. Ah, there you go. <laughs> um, anyway. I think, I think most of the time when people use social media, that's the problem with content distribution. What do they do? They take, okay, I've written an article. I have an infographic. I have a video. And what do they do? They take it. They like, throw the link on Facebook. They go to all the Facebook group. They throw a link or on their feed. Well, guess what? Somebody on Facebook, somebody on LinkedIn, they're just not interested in clicking on the link. I mean, there are a few people who will click. They probably know you. They're your friends. They like. But if you're targeting targeting an audience, social media and how you use content, I've written a blog post. How do I actually distribute it on social media? So usually, for example, we will take bits and pieces of that article uh, that we find interesting, and we use them as posts on LinkedIn. Um, and then we'll say, hey, you know, in the comments, like, you know, this is a full article about this. So it, it's not the full article that you're just throwing there. It's not a link to an article, but it's rather the small pieces that you that you include that you know will actually intrigue people because that's the other thing. Like, oh, this is an amazing article. Okay, can you pick four or five interesting points from it? Have a really good hook where people are going to say, oh, I'd like to read more have them read a little bit more, and then they'll say, you know what, where's the full article? So we see that works really well for us. Yeah, I mean, I definitely love the different levels of user engagement that you're creating. The person can read your quick post and move on. The person can dig for more information if they'd like it, and then that person can visit that link if, they, if they'd like. You're uh, leaving everything available for the users without excluding everyone. I love it. Exactly. And I, I do think that, you know, using using social media to distribute content, you know, to get people to actually visit your website, that can be effective, too. But it changes the game when when the goal is to bring value right there. You know what what we might ask ourselves, what value can I bring to the user? How can my brand be present without asking the user to do anything else? other than just what they're doing, just kind of scrolling through reading content. LinkedIn is especially qualifying because usually when users are on LinkedIn, they're there for business. You know, very rarely do I, I, I don't think I've ever purchased anything from, from LinkedIn the, the same way that you do other channels. And it's just, it's just the nature of the beast. So in a way, you know, LinkedIn users are definitely pre-qualified to have that professional conversation to talk about this stuff, like they're ready. And uh, that definitely speaks to why the conversations tend to work better on that channel. I would be interesting to hear your experience on Twitter. I love Twitter personally. I, I love marketing Twitter. It's a whole little community. I've been on like the PPC chat community of Twitter since really, really early on in my career. And it helped me feel, you know, kind of out, not in a bubble so much. Yeah. It felt, especially in, in agency life, you know, it feels like everything that's happening to you is super your fault. And if you don't know something, that's also your fault too. So to have the community out there that shares information and just helps you learn and, and grow as a professional, it's there for support. I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, everything on LinkedIn can be exactly the same. We're all, we're dancing, we're centering around the drain on creating valuable conversations on social media. And then your content is there when it's, it's time to, to have it be present, to have that conversation around the content. Yeah. I love it. And, and, and I think, by the way, a point that you said, it really is at the heart of this. 
um, lots of times when people go to social media channels, what they're thinking, how can I get people to my website? How can I? it's very self-centered. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of funny because we, as marketers, we always talk about focus on the customer, focus on the customer, focus on the customer. I think we've repeated that phrase so much that it's almost became meaningless. Yeah. Um, but then when you see how marketers approach social media, they're like thinking, okay, how can I drive more traffic to my website? If you put that aside completely and don't worry about that and you focus on providing value which is i know sounds generic and i hate sometimes like i'm like ah you know you say something and i was like i can't believe i just said that but it is what it is that's the best expression that i have um people will find you so a, a really good example of this is uh, a friend harry uh dry uh marketing examples I mean, the guy started marketing examples what a year and a half ago um and he was a developer uh, he grew an email list, and it's very impressive, um, grew an email list to about 55,000, I think, as of today. Oh, wow. um, and it's funny because all he does, he gives examples of marketing, very short, sweet. He does it on Twitter. He does it on LinkedIn. Um, he, he distributes his content really well. But here's something interesting that he does. He never actually puts a link to the original article, never does. But people are so fascinated by his content that they actually find the website and they subscribe to the website. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I can't do that. You know, I'm like, you got to, And he's like, you got to disconnect. Process. Yeah, like, he's like, what? you got to trust. You got to trust the process. He's like, he's like, you put down good content consistently, people will find the website. And he has fifty five thousand email subscribers in a year and a half. Uh, I, I joke about that. I'm like, God, man, it took us like, you know, it took us 10, 15 years to build 30,000 people on our email list. Um, that's very impressive though. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there are a couple of reasons why I'm not saying it's easy to build an email list at all, ever, anytime. It's never easy, especially one that cares about what you're reading. But the marketing examples is general enough that this applies to so many users. Like everybody in this general industry would be interested in this. We don't have to get too specific or too niche with anything. It's, it's, it serves the purpose. And then we move on to the next thing. I am definitely going to check out marketing examples. I, I follow a couple other email lists where um, there's one that I love. It's an A-B test. And then you guess which one ended oh, up yes. in more sales. I, I forget the exact chain. Uh, I know that there is a woman named Deborah involved that yes. pushes these out and I feel very bad that I don't have her last name here, but they're awesome. And it's, it really speaks to, you know, there's the initial, what we think as marketers is going to work. And it's so funny how many times the only thing you can consistently rely on in marketing is that everything will change all the time. <laughs> so we always have to be testing and we always have to be thinking about the different user processes and, and, you know, where that goes to result in that stronger conversion. Those mailing lists are, are awesome. They also allow us as marketers to jump in really quickly, pay attention to this for a second, and then move on to our yeah. day. And uh, in a way, maybe we could use that as a jumping off point. You know, as we mentioned, conversion rate optimization, nowadays, it's its own thing. It's its own service. It's its own business, obviously, that, that, that you can offer. But it really is centered around improving sales from the, the web, wherever conversions come from, you know, optimizing that process. It's about taking all of the different things together and, you know, optimizing them for that sale. So I'd be curious, you know, what some of your favorite pieces of advice when we start that process, you know, involved, obviously conversion rate optimization needs to be uh, relevant to the website at hand, not no two websites are going to be the same, small things are going to differ for each business, but I'm sure there are you know, key, key takeaways that we can uh, keep in mind when we're trying to optimize any website or any funnel for conversion. Yeah. So uh, sort of, sort of interesting. Um, I always say, if I want to simplify conversion rate optimization, the way I think about it, um, at the very high level, you look at the website and you're looking for two things. You're looking for areas where the website is broke, whatever that means. We'll just leave it vague enough to say the website is broke. <laughs> Um, and then areas where the website is functioning correctly, but you can look for additional revenue streams. Um, usually when you do this analysis and you can use different methods, you come up with a humongous list of things. Uh, sometimes a <laughs> hundred items that could be fixed or could be added to the website or could be improved. Um, you prioritize those and you say, you know, it's okay, here's a problem. Based on my prioritization, I think this problem really will have the most impact on, on the bottom line. This is, you know, this problem is dollars in the bank. Um, you figure that out. The next thing you do is you say, okay, well, okay, so I've identified a problem over here. 
how do I, like, I'm gonna create a new design, maybe new flow on the website, maybe new copy, could be anything, correct to fix the issue. Um, you create that, the, the best solution that you can think of. And then ultimately you do what we call A-B testing, correct? So your website is getting 100,000 visitors and you think that your maybe your brand positioning or your messaging on the homepage is not very strong. Okay, well, here's better brand positioning. I, I was talking to a company today in the morning. They sell these products where you basically subscribe. It's an e-commerce subscription business. Um, for kids between ages five and 10, you subscribe and then your son or your daughter start getting these uh, basically uh, the weekly mail with games that they can play like you know, on paper and whatnot. So I was joking with him because he's like, he's struggling with his conversion rate to see the half a percent. And he's like, oh, surely we can do better. And I'm like, you can do better, but here's something. I have a five-year-old and I have a 10-year-old. I looked at your website. He contacted us a couple of days ago. And I looked at you, I looked at his website for two days and I could not figure out what he does. I'm like, I feel the life of me, you know, and, and I'm your target audience. All I see is like, it's perfect for kids ages five to 10. I'm like, I'm like, I knew it had something to do with my kids, but I could not figure I could not. Granted, it's a new concept. So I was not sure what it is, but I'm like, sure. Because it took him about 30 seconds to explain it to me. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. Here, I shall subscribe to your service. Mm. <clears throat> so uh, ultimately, you come up with a solution, you have your visitors 100,000, you split them between the old design, the new design, 50,000 visitors will see the old design, 50,000 visitors will see the new design, and you let your visitors be the judge. Your visitors are gonna tell you which design works better. How do they tell you? By the number of orders, by the number of subscriptions, by the number of contacts, it depends on the website, but how many conversions is each design generating? So fundamentally, figure out the issues, come up with a solution, test it out, and let people be the judge. Um, I always joke that I've been humbled way too many times where I think to myself, this design is absolutely amazing. This design is going to kill it. Mm. And people think Amen. otherwise. Yes. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we've done, we've done <laughs> 23,000 A-B tests until now. A ton of A-B tests. Um, <laughs> and we're very proud, I think, with our success rate. So our success rate hovers around 48 to 49%. So about half of the A-B tests that wow. we run are successful. And we're always touting that, that success, like hey, half of our A-B tests. So we're working with a company, a large $1.5 million company. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, when, when you work with a big company like that, you give them even a 5% lift. That's just absolutely inc incredible. So I was looking at the results today. We've been working with them now. Well, we're talking about four months. So we've done close to 22 A-B tests with them in the, in the past four months. And our success, our success rate is at 20%. And I'm like, what's happening, guys? They're like, you know what? They've got all the basics that we can hit covered. Um, you know, still, you know, I mean, you're talking about four successful A-B tests. And for them, I think those four successful A-B tests were a few million dollars because we can't tell you how much. But nonetheless, yeah. I'm like, oh. Would have been really nice if fifty percent of the tests generated generated lifts. So that that's at a very high level when we talk about improving conversion rates. Tactically, um, th there are certain things that you do, and I always say, you know, you, there are certain things you have to get out of the way before you start thinking about like, okay, well, I need to I need to really tremendously increase my conversion rates. Um, one thing is the website needs to be bug free, and and people laugh sometimes and I tell them you, you'll be mm. amazed. Critical. Uh, yes. So my, my mother-in-law is trying to use PayPal uh, yesterday. Uh, she's an older uh, lady and she doesn't know how to use it on her phone. So she calls mm -hmm. my wife and she's trying to, she forgot her username. She forgot the password. Classic. Now, I, I know, I actually know the <laughs> PayPal team does, and that's a, like, you know, I know them rather well and I know how much testing they do. But it's funny, yeah. the amount of struggle. I mean, at the end, after a while, and I'm sitting there on the phone and my wife is talking to her 45 minutes into it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm like, hold on, hold on. We're doing this wrong. She had signed up for PayPal using her phone number. Just use it and you sign up and you figure out the password and then tell it to her. It's like, oh, I should have done this instead of trying there to get her on the phone. Um, Just hack it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's funny because like, you know, here, here, like, you know, like, silly small bugs that you don't think about because you're used to your website um, yeah. and you don't notice the issues uh, you don't notice the issues in it so you you want to get all the bugs out of the way um, something else you want to get mobility out of the way and it's funny we're 2021 
and everybody says they are mobile first. And I always joke about that when, some, when a designer tells me I'm mobile first, and I'm like, show me your designs. What did, what's the first thing that they show me? Their desktop designs. <laughs> I'm like, I thought you're mobile first. Uh, mobile first means you design a mobile first. Really, it does mean that. And then you do the desktop. Uh, most of our clients get 70, 80% of their traffic on, on mobile. So I'm like, okay, let's, yep. let's design a mobile. So make sure that that mobile experience, thinking about the visitor's mindset, um, is actually smooth. And it's easy for people to do whatever they need, they need to do. <clears throat> the... Third thing, so you figured out like the bugs and the mobility. So this is kind of the bottom of the of the pyramid, if you want you want to think of it that way. The second level is usability issues, and usability is silly things. You're pressing on a button, you expect something to happen, and it's not happening. Uh, you're yeah. pressing on a button, and you're not sure if the website is doing something and, or it's not. You're just sitting there. It's like, I need, should I press again? Should I? You're scrolling and it's nothing's happening. Exactly. So the, like, you know, and, and there are so many usability principles that have been written about since the 80s, even pre-internet. So you want to make sure that the website is really user-friendly. And then at the top level, you want to think about conversion and persuasion. How do I actually persuade people to convert? Now, lots of times people confuse, confuse usability with persuasion, and I tell them, oh, yeah, two, two, two different things. So, a user friendly website, um, when the visitor's coming to it and they're navigating through it, you know, they're thinking to themselves, oh, I can, I can buy from here, versus a website that's optimized for persuasion. The visitor's not thinking that. The visitor's thinking to themselves, oh, I have to buy this. I have to get this. That shift in the mindset of your visitor is absolutely tremendous and it's difficult to achieve. And that shift is when you go from a 2% conversion rate to a 4% to an 8% conversion rate, just complete transformation for, for a business. Yeah, my gosh, I love I love everything that we covered. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny how, how closely related SEO or even design is, is related to what we're talking about. You know, they're all very thematic. The Venn diagram opens yes. or uh, overlaps quite a bit, quite a bit, uh, especially for, for a number of reasons. The first that comes to mind is, you know, making sure that there's no bugs. The story that you bring up is uh, it hits extra home for me because my mother, uh, her favorite device is her iPad. She does not have a desktop. And of course, iPad is not really quite as supported, you know, in yeah. terms of design, but there are still users on it and there are still people trying to figure this out. So I will say that one of the things that I have discovered, and this could be totally personal, but it might still be applicable when it comes to PayPal and their usability studies, you are still very, very reliant on the user to, just to put it bluntly, read the yeah. prompts that are in front of them just to, you know, do this and X will happen. And then the user doesn't read that prompt. So they're, they're kind of, they're relying on the experience more than the detailed instruction that's literally in front of them. And that in itself, you know, kind of speaks to usability versus functionality. Yes, function means that this instruction is in front of you and you can follow it if you'd like. Usability is, are, are, is it, do we make it easy for you to follow it? What's the likelihood that you're actually going to do these things? Exactly. And PayPal is such a good example because there's key things that you do. You just need to read the prompt. It's a 30 word prompt, but it does give you a, a, a set of instructions. And if you don't read it, certain usability features won't make sense. So I do think that that's definitely a challenge that PayPal is, is got to struggle with, you know, it's all the different devices and all the different users coming together, but user error and usability, they, they are much less about logic and much more about, you know, opening the paths for the user to get to what you want them to do. Definitely. It's, it's sort of funny. So yesterday I got this email and it's basically, I have to sign up the kids for the soccer program, the youth program and it's like the deadline is like no that not yesterday i'm like ah okay i'm gonna do it and i'm sitting upstairs and i'm like my laptop is downstairs i'm like i can do this on my mobile phone <clears throat> granted it's a, like you know it's an association and it's free and like you know and like you know they have it's funny on my phone like a whole bunch of pdfs that i'm supposed to read through which i'm they could have literally probably like you know bought my house and i didn't summarize i was just like you know just signing but I reached the end after so many pages filling up and like, you know, every time it gives me an error, I have to go back and look, oh, I need to click here. Oh, I need to sign my name here. Yeah. And I reached the end and it's, there's two buttons. So I'm like, oh, the big button, I click on it. And it's like, you know, I've canceled the application. I'm like, I didn't cancel the application. I've just spent like, you know, like 10 minutes and I measured oh, no. the kids' heights. 
So I run through it. I reach the last point and I'm like, I need to be careful. And turns out the way they designed it. Beware. It's like, there's a button for save. There's a button for cancel, which they decided to make it really large. That's kind of the largest button. And on the phone, I couldn't see it, but on the rightmost side, like, you know, like a corner in the right corner, lower corner is the kind of like, you know, submit button. And I'm like, I didn't see that. So like, I'm like, this time I will be careful. So silly things yeah. like that, but imagine the amount of frustrations. And if I didn't my, my, have my wife, it was like, did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? I probably would have said, you know what? I don't need to deal with this, but you know. Well, exactly. And if you were, and that brings us back to what we're doing here, you know, we're, we're doing this for, for business and other businesses are trying to do this too. So you trying to use a website and not being able to, even though we all thought it would work out, that affects sales, that affects, you know, you as a customer, you're frustrated as the individual. So now you're attaching that frustration to this brand. You know, the small, tiny things that usability, or uh, I guess usability tests, but, you know, Q&A testing really <laughs> is what it is, you know, as you're going through. And they're, they're vital just to know what the user experience is when they're trying to complete the action that you're asking them to take. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely critical. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, so th think about this. So we talked about the group of the bugs and the usability issues, but then uh, I'll give an example from, from an A-B test that we're about to launch big furniture retailer um, and furniture. I mean, everybody wants to order furniture because everybody has been stuck at home. Yep. And <laughs> the shipping time for them for an item to leave the warehouse is anywhere between three to five days. So that's the standard they have that on, their, on all their products. Well, it turns out that based on the warehouse and when the, the customer is ordering, sometimes the shipping time when, for, the, for the item to arrive, it could be anywhere between one to three days. And we're like, listen, this would be would be an actually an interesting test to see instead of having the standard three to five days, how about one to three days for certain items? Let's test that. Now, the technology to implement something like that is a bit a bit hard, but here you're not necessarily removing a bug, but you're just making it easier for people because everybody's looking for that instant gratification. And yeah. we say, oh, I'm gonna have to wait for three to five days to like you know, for this to ship versus oh, it can actually ship out today in the afternoon or tomorrow it makes a huge difference. So it'll be interesting to see kind of the impact of that on the bottom line for that, that particular e-commerce website. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because it's almost like the user is used to Amazon level delivery. So now other businesses in order to compete, you know, that preference has become so common to us. We're like, well, why can't I have it now immediately? <laughs> why isn't a drone delivering my thing to my door? And it's because Amazon has normalized that. Yeah. So now other brands have to try and fold that concept in. It's wild. I, I think that's what's amazing about Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. how, how long has it been? Like you know, now, like you know, almost like we're, we're getting probably 12, 13, 12, 13 years since. A while, like, like more last. than 10. Yeah. Um, but the concept is very simple. You know, and it satisfies what people want, you know, yeah. deliver the item really quickly. And I'm going to make you actually pay for it annually. But mm -hmm. okay. So we are paying for it. Uh, and not only that, we're actually more committed to the brand, correct? By having the Amazon Prime. And we're going to try and have, you know, the best prices that we can. Not all the time, but, you know, uh, it, 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 it is something that humans are always looking forward, like, you know, looking for. We want something, things really quickly and we want them cheap. Very simple it's things. It's a genius, genius per, uh, idea. Um, two thirds of U.S. households have an Amazon uh, Prime subscription. The conversion rate, and, and this is absolutely amazing. So Amazon's website conversion rate pre uh, pre Prime, the conversion rate was about eighteen percent, fourteen to eighteen percent, give or take. It depends on the on the season. Prime, uh, take a wild guess. Let's see. What do you think the uh, for the conversion rate for Prime members? Throw a number. If you know uh, that, that prime is about 18%. Sure. Yeah. Uh, my initial judgment would be just to double it. You know, if it's at 20%, let's make it 40. But given that prime okay. users are, you know, committed and they're ready, I guess, you know, I would say maybe 50, 60%. It's about 71%. Oh, wow. Nice. I mean, it's, it's just a, the, the minute I see that, I'm like, oh my God, this is absolutely genius uh, to have such an amazing product where people are just basically buying constantly buying from you, you know, and yeah. it's very simple, but it also goes back into another principle in psychology. When you introduce a new feature, people are fascinated by it, but then there's something that we call the keynote effect. We get used to things. What was absolutely amazing a year ago, you get used to, and it's a cost, not absolutely amazing. As a matter of fact, it's what I expect yeah. nowadays. Um, 
so I lived for a little while. Uh, we, we opened an office in Turkey and I'm not Turkish. People assume like you open an office in Turkey. I'm like, I don't speak a word of Turkish. I'm not Turkish, but for, <laughs> uh, we had some clients in the Middle East. We had some clients in Japan and Turkey made sense. And over there, which was really absolutely amazing. You order an item and you get it the same day. You get it in two, three hours. Wow. That's a whole other level of expectations because with Amazon, and of course the US is much larger, but you order yeah. something and I'm like, oh, I did not expect that the first time it arrived within two hours. I'm like, oh, that's nice. You know, I just ordered this <laughs> and it's here, um, you know, but- Almost again, like shopping. Uh, exactly. It's just even, even nicer, you know, it just makes you feel mm -hmm. really lazy because you don't go and everything's free shipping. You don't have to pay membership or anything like that. I'm like, oh, this is really good. Uh, but again, humans get used to things. And because of Amazon and what they've done, they got us used to, I want my item and I want it really quickly. Yeah. Uh, deliver it to me. And, and that's a tough time for retailers competing with Amazon. Well, we, we work with targets and target competes with Amazon. And oh gosh, you know, always trying to figure out like, you know, what to do. But I think when you compete, it's sort of funny when you're really giants or competing, competing against giants, that's one battle. When you're a small brand, and you're competing against giants, it's a completely different battle because yes, yeah. they have the money and they have the resources, but there's one thing that you have that they don't have. You have the flexibility and being able to change things and make silly mistakes and no one would notice versus like if Amazon makes a mistake, everybody's going to be talking about it. So truth. I mean, there's a lot of publicity yeah. involved in, in being Amazon and being on the forefront, but yeah, I mean that you definitely speak to one of the reasons why conversion rate optimization tends to fall in the back burner for us is, you know, clients are, are nervous to test out new things. You know, what if it doesn't work? What if we have 20%, you know, success rates instead of the 50% that we're used to. And it's, you know, that's why we're here. That's why we're testing. That's why we're, we're getting through, you know, this conversion rate right now is where it is. And the goal of even failed tests, even experiments that don't turn out the way that we want them, no tests really fail, right? Because we're, yeah. we're constantly learning anyway. Uh, but if something doesn't go the way that we want it to, it's, it's going to help that long-term conversion rate. Yeah, so I mean, we've definitely touched on a, a lot of different things. I could personally talk about, you know, the concepts of, of businesses and websites being functional, usable, and persuasive you know, for hours, but we are getting a little close to time. Uh, so to kind of bring things right back, maybe we can just kind of quick fire a couple pieces of advice that we could share with the audience here today. Uh, in terms of what you use to A-B test and optimize, there's obviously softwares out there. There's obviously, you can use your own brain to map out your processes and walk through it. At the agency, we like to use Google Optimize because it can, it can tie into Tag Manager and analytics and all of that kind of fun stuff for us. But I'd be curious what kind of tools you have in your toolbox for something like this. Obviously, there's going to be industry specific ones, but there might be other ones that yeah. non CRO pros can use as well. Definitely. So Google Optimize, if somebody's just starting out, I highly recommend it. Um, it's free. It's available. Um, you know, it integrates with Google Analytics as part of Google Analytics. So you have the data there. Um, so it's, it's there and it's definitely capturing more and more of the market. Now, as people get a bit more serious about testing, there is, there's about 30 different software A-B testing platforms that are available. Uh, we have our own platform, which our clients, clients use. It's called FIGPI, F-I-G-P-I-I. Um, we've had it since 2011, 12. Uh, so that's really what the larger companies, the Ebays and the Targets, they end up using something, something like that. And the nice thing about it, it offers heat maps, session recording, polling, so all integrated into one. Um, some of the other tools that are really good also in A-B testing, uh, Optimize Lead definitely is a leader in the space, yep. but they also, they are a leader when it comes to price. <laughs> so you're, you're looking at spending probably at least $100,000 yep. annually, if not more. Um, I like VWO. I've known, by the way, Optimize Lead went to an agency before they became Optimize Lead. <laughs> no, uh, well, there you go. And they, uh, it's funny. So they, they, they used to be an agency. This is just very funny because a Magento agency, by the way, mm -hmm. and they would go to the Magento conferences and then they build the product. So somebody a few years ago, he's like, oh yeah, there was this agency. I don't know what happened to them. I'm like, which agency is like optimizely. I'm like, I'm like, oh man, you're so disconnected. I they're know not what another agency. They're <laughs> the largest AB testing platform. He's like, really? I'm like, yes, you're just not hooked into the space. Under a rock, I guess. <laughs> yeah. uh, VWO is a really good, uh, good platform. Um, that's we've, you know, we've used VWO since it was in beta as well. We, we, we like, we like the guys over there. 
Um, otherwise, there's a ton of ton of other uh, other platforms, but those are kind of like the popular platforms that that you'll you'll hear. Absolutely, yeah. I've used Optimizely a lot for a long time. I think it, since 2013, even you know, back back when they were a little smaller and they were kind yes. of an option to poke around with. Yeah, Optimizely is a big one. Uh, if you have made your own tools, this is something that kind of personally interests me because I definitely have a lot of tools in my SEO and marketing toolbox yeah. and all of them do a slightly different thing. It would be really great if they all did the one thing exactly how I would like them to be done, <laughs> which is kind of exactly what it sounds like what you have built does. So I'd be curious how FigPi, is that how we would say yeah. that? Yeah, F-I-G-P-I-I, okay. yep, FigPi. Cool, F-I-G-P-I-I, -I. for everybody to search FigPi. Um, yeah, I'd be really interested to hear what that brings to the table that is different than what Optimizely or even Google L, you know, uh, Optimize can do. So what, what, one thing that it does compared to other A-B testing platforms, it combines all these different tools that we use in conversion optimization. So um, lots of times when you do conversion optimizations, you want heat maps and you want session recording and you want polling, correct? Uh, so you end up installing, well, you know, for heat maps and session recording, we'll do hot jar and for polling, yep. we'll do another. So, and, and the problem with all these different tools is they slow down the websites. <laughs> so like five seconds here and seven seconds there. And the idea is to help you actually increase conversion rates. Um, so we said, you know what's a single line of code you drop on your website and you have access to those tools. Um, right. But really that's not, okay, it's, it's unique. And I, I'm, like, I'm kind of the brains behind the platform. Um, but I think to myself, I'm like, okay, so we just built a platform that combines other platforms. What's interesting, which right now we have in beta, you can actually use machine learning. So imagine you're on an e-commerce website and you have people who are converting and which let's say 1% of your visitors, 99% of the visitors don't convert. Well, you can look at the actions of the people who converted and you can say, okay, well, there's this distinct pattern that they follow, correct? And they all click on the add to cart, they all go through the checkout, but even how they interact with the product page, can I figure out a particular pattern? And what can I learn from that pattern to actually apply to those who did not convert? So we are in the beta testing process where the tool doesn't give you data because I think we live in a time where as a marketer, we live through data obesity. There's just too much data. The problem is not with the data. The problem is what do you do with the data? So mm -hmm. what the platform is going to be giving is actual recommendations. Go ahead and change this, change, change that. Actual recommendations of changes you can make from your website to actually improve conversion rates and improve usability, which I think is a game changer because there's plenty of tools that give you data, but this is a tool that actually, yes, it will give you the data, but it will actually give you the exact changes. And I think that, that, that will take it to a whole other level. Yeah, I mean, that's what the marketers of CRO do, you know, without a platform like this is take data and then translate that into things that, you know, non non marketers can can know and maybe even marketers, but non CRO pros can implement. And it sounds like that software just speeds that that process right up. Yeah, that is definitely something I want to take a look at, even for our own agency tools. You know, we're always trying to figure out the small things that we can do to push the needle to grow. Obviously, growth is exponential. And, you know, if, if there's it, it's very rarely the one thing that takes off and changes the entire businesses. It's usually, you know, the small incremental ones that make the impact. Yeah, I always think, you know, what's the, the way I think of marketing and growth, it's a flywheel. This is very slow to move, correct? This puts a lot of effort into moving it. But the minute it starts moving, it really starts moving, correct? This just takes yeah. uh, But that's, that's the reason sometimes, you know, somebody comes and says, yeah, I want to try SEO. I want to try PPC. I want to try CRO uh, for three months and see how it works. And I tell them, if you're going to do that, just don't do it. Save your money. Um, you're better off not doing that. And they're like, why? I'm like, because... Because growth is not the light switch you turn on and off. It's not. Yep. It's consistent effort. It's uh, it's a journey, and it's a journey that's full of like you no know, discovery, mistakes that you make. Because what worked for one marketer, and they swear by it, and they tell you it's a secret. It's no longer a secret. It might not work for your audience. Uh, so I was yeah. telling them, you know, it's, it's a slow process. You got to be committed to it. And if you're not committed to it, you can try something for three months, save the money, do something else. And, and sometimes people say, really? I'm like, yeah, because. Really? If somebody tries something for three months, they're probably not giving it enough chance. And then they're going to get frustrated and they're going to frustrate whether it's the agency or the marketer that they're working with and leaves bad taste in everybody's mouth. So I'm like, you know what? There is no need to go through that. We're friends. Let's stay friends. You know, you can find something somewhere else. You can spend your money. Oh my gosh. I love everything that you just said, because so much of that is 
is what we have to even kind of bring to the table with our own clients. People are like, I want the results now. Uh, this has been running for 10 days. Why don't I have sales? Like it's not profitable after 21 days, we should cut it off. You know, I think that's a great approach. If, if, if we're playing the short game, then there's other things to do, but you know, this, this isn't about the short game and uh, you know, growth doesn't happen in, in the short game. These, these small things, they, they take time, obviously, in, in things like SEO and even uh, conversion rate optimization as it relates to UX design, you know, we pay very close attention to the small incremental changes that we know will push that needle that much further. So I kind of love the, the bluntness of just saying, if you're going to try this for 90 days and it'll be a make or break decision, you can find better ways to, to blow that budget, you know, to spend that budget to, to, to look elsewhere if, if you're not ready to kind of play the long-term game. I think that's a, a critical point for sure. I, I, saw, I saw remember one day, and this is back uh, 2010, um, we had an influx of clients and this one company signs up with us. And, you know, you're, you're doing A-B testing, you don't really know. I mean, you're doing your best effort to do the analysis and come up with a new design, but you're not sure. And you don't know whether what you're doing is going to work or not. And the first test did about 35% increase. So we're, we're high-fiving in the company. We're doing really well. And I call the CEO of the company, uh, Brad. And I don't know if I remember, like, oh, there's a few clients that just stick in my mind. I'm like, Brad, this is great. But, and he's just quiet. And I'm, I, I can sense that, that he's very quiet. And I'm like, what's going on? You know, you don't seem to be very excited. He's like, yeah, we have to really end the relationship. And I'm like, oh man. I'm like, what happened? Did some, I'm thinking like, you know, somebody says something or they're out of, he's like, no. He's like, no, I mean, it's great that you guys did 35%, but I was looking for 65%. And I'm like, sorry. I'm like, why did anybody from our <laughs> team promise that? He said, no, yeah. I really need a 65%. And I'm like, you know what? You need sixty-five percent. It is better to end the relationship. It is like you know. Let's just let's just walk away. Um, so you know, you you, you choose your battles. Uh, I would yeah. say you know, life is hard. Conversion optimization is hard. So you want to make sure that whenever you're working with a company, they are the right fit. Um, sometimes you know, I, I joke about copywriters. Over the years, we've hired hundreds of copywriters. Some were really amazing, and we loved their copy. Some were really amazing and we hated their copy. They're, they're still amazing, it has nothing to do with them. It's just the style of copywriting that we do with our projects. So I always say, I'm like, you know what? You know, it's just not, not a good fit. Um, so you gotta make sure that you're the right fit for them. They are the right fit for you. And that's how you can actually, because you wanna enjoy that relationship. Um, and that's how you, everybody grows. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even to, to put emphasis on an arbitrary rate, as opposed to the actual dollars that are coming in. You know, I'm sure if we could translate that 30% increase or this 30% improvement rate, whatever it was, if we were to translate that to, to sales dollars, you know, I'm sure that that is a different different name of the game. So it's funny how these, you know, I, I would consider a 30% increase to be huge, you know, in terms of conversion rate. But, you know, if, if you're to just pick arbitrary numbers out of the sky, you know, that's it's tough. It's tough to... Yeah to meet that there's obviously you know maybe the timing's not right or maybe the salesperson or whoever is looking for that is uh they, they could uh try paid search or something else where we're able to control that you know yeah. sales funnel a little bit quicker but i agree kind of tying tying uh importance to the rates versus the actual dollars and tangible things it, you, you can end a good relationship without without the right reason Definitely. Yeah, so we're actually uh, just at an hour. I do have a couple questions to uh, ask rapid fire at the end that we do have. The QA looks a little slim, but I, I do have a couple in, in the queue there. Uh, one of them is, uh, what, it, what is conversion rate, optimization, conversion rate optimization beyond just changing buttons? Uh, oh. So maybe to translate this is, you know, what, what, what are key elements that can be tested or that we would optimize on the page or on a website? So if you think about things that you can change on a website, there's what we call element level testing. I'm changing a button, I'm changing an image, I'm changing a headline. Um, and those are simple and they're really quick. It might take like an, an hour, sometimes half an hour to implement. Oh, I'm going to change a button. We rarely do element level testing. Um, we might do it the very first test that we're testing something with a client just to make sure that all the plumbing and the configuration is done correctly. But the second level is what we call page level testing. We're changing the layout of the page. We're changing elements of the page. We're changing some of the functionality on the, uh, on the page. 
um, that's a bit more complex that takes a little bit of time to implement the A-B test. And that's where you start seeing some results. That's when you use your site conversion rate goes from 1% to 1.10 to 1.2%. So there's actual really good impact on the bottom line. The next level of testing is what we call use user flow testing. So perfect, perfect example I can give of this. I'm going to test a single step checkout versus a multi-step checkout and see which one works better. Um, that's a lot more complex to implement, requires a lot more effort. We, we did a huge project a couple months ago testing this. It took us almost 150 hours to, to implement uh, that single wow. test. So that, that's a humongous project. And by the way, it lost. So in, mm. in that particular case, <laughs> a multi-step checkout worked better, which is sort of interesting. Um, Hello. Yeah, and, and then the, the, the last level of testing is what we call message testing, which is a bit scary, correct? Here's your positioning. Here's how you can take different positioning, different, so you're testing some of the copy. Um, we don't do a lot of, like, again, going back to the question, uh, what's a level of testing? Yeah, you can do it. Um, I think we did a case study with Google. This is, again, about you know, 11, I had to calculate this, like 11, 12 years ago where the test was focused on the different shades of blue when you sign up. And I think the test was 4,000 different colors for the shades of blue you cannot wow. even recognize. Now, blue, now, Google gets enough traffic to justify a test like that. And, and the winner had about 7 or 8% left in conversions. Would not advise doing that for 99.5%. That's of so the many. Yeah. So like, you know, it's not something that we recommend testing for, for many people. Focus on the page level. Uh, that's a good place to start. Yeah, nice. No, for sure. I mean, I, I think that that's one of the main uh, pieces of feedback that we get from our clients where they're like, yes, I've heard of conversion rate optimization and I just didn't know where to start. I think it just means changing the buttons on the page to blue instead of orange. I mean, it's, it's great to hear that that's not just the only thing there is. You know, that's obviously a small one. Why, why don't you guys focus on elemental testing? Does it just not move the needle quite as much? Hardly, as yeah, I mean, like, you know, if you run it long enough, in all honesty, so even when it shows you run an A-B test and it shows that, oh, you have a winner. Um, you let it run long enough, everything converts into the mean. It's just like, you know, that winner goes back and you're like, oh, it didn't really help. Um, or, and that, that's the reason why like, you know, at some point, 15 years ago, yeah, that's what we did. We tested buttons and we've tested images and we tested, uh, and we thought that we had winners. So we're like, oh, this color won or this headline won. And then we deployed on the website. I was like, well, there was no change in conversion rates for the website. So that's why we moved into a bit more complex testing uh, and we see better results with that. It, it does take a little bit longer. So on average, A-B test for us right now and in, last, in, uh, in the first quarter uh, of uh, 2021 was about 23 hours to implement. So it takes a bit of man hours, correct? To be able to implement an mm -hmm. A-B test. Uh, but we see better results with those. We see that like, you know, we're able to do uh, a pump in, in conversion rates. Absolutely. Classic, you uh, you get what you put into it kind of situation. That makes sense, though. Uh, I think we probably have time for one other question, uh, the one that I like that jumps out. What's a good time frame to evaluate your A-B test or your test when you run conversion rate optimization? So you, you're... You, uh... For a single A-B test, well, let's talk about a website. If you're going to do any type of A-B testing on the website, first, you want to distinguish between mobile and desktop. because There's two separate platforms. You, you run an A-B test on mobile you versus you run desktop on, uh, test on desktop. That's very important. At a minimum, you need to have about 500 conversions uh, for the landing page or for the website. If, if a website has 100 conversions, if it has 50 conversions, don't do A-B testing. You can still do conversion optimization because you can still improve the page. You cannot just use A-B testing to validate. So you're really relying on best practices. You're really, you, and I always tell people, like you have to trust the company that you're working with. It's just that you don't have enough data to validate, you know, but that's reason trust becomes really important. Uh, lots of times, small companies come to us and they say, oh, we got to hire you. I tell them, um, you only have hundred conversions a month, which means testing is out of the window. You have to trust us. You don't know us really well. You think Khaled knows what he's talking about, but then you're working with the team and, you got to really be committed even more than a larger company. So that's number one. Number two, you look at the page and then there's lots of statistical tools out there where you put the number of visitors to that, coming to that page. You say, okay, this page, let's say we take a simple landing page and I'm trying to get people to fill out a contact form and I'm getting, let's say 500 fills a month. 
10,000 people coming, five, 500 of them are filling out. So the conversion rate is five, you know, 5%. Then you do the math. You say, well, you know, this A-B test, I assume is going to give me at least 20% lift. The actual tool, uh, the statistical analysis tool will tell you, okay, you need to run this test for two weeks, one week. Um, usually at a minimum, regardless of what the tools tell us, we don't run tests for less than a week. You do an A-B test for eBay, literally within two hours, we can reach conclusion because they have enough visitors and enough conversions. Tell them, well, okay, we only tested two hour window. We need to run this test for at least a week. We like to run tests for more than a week, less than four weeks, and we take the guidance of the statistical analysis tool. So it's a combination uh, between all of these things to help us decide how long we run an, an A-B test. Long answer, yeah, and now, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's a, a really valuable one that the shift in thinking, you know, so many people are thinking, okay, well, how many, how many months do I need to run this? Do I run it for three months and then look at it at months and to shift it to conversion, the conversion amount. Some companies will get 500 conversions in a day. Some companies will get 500 conversions in a hundred days. And that sets your time frame. It's that's very applicable to, you know, paid search or any kind of media-based campaigns where Google will even for searching uh, or our, excuse me, smart search campaigns, they require a threshold of conversions. And then people will not meet that threshold and they'll say, you know, smart bidding doesn't work, you know, it, it's yeah. not applicable for me. And it's because we haven't given the bots enough data to work with so it's kind of interesting how that that aligns perfectly you know it depends more on the activity that's coming in and not these arbitrary time frames that, yeah. that we put in yeah, it basically depends on the number of visitors number of conversions the conversion rates that gives you a much better it's sort of interesting because if you look at whether it's google or facebook because you can do a b testing correct on the, on the ads um, and the methodology, Can. definitely, definitely. <laughs> you know, but the methodology that those companies use is different than your standard methodology because they're different mediums and they're able to serve and they're able to do a little bit more analysis. So they actually are able to make a decision faster than if we, if I'm running an AB test on a website and, uh, we worked with one client, absolutely amazing. He used to be a Facebook guy, end up quitting he does his own thing, single guy that has a business that's about $5 million, just selling lessons online. Um, and Thanks. because, yeah, like, I'm like, so I'm like, I'm like, how big is the company? He's like, it's me and my part-time secretary. And I'm like, oh, you're doing 5 million. I'm like, I'm in the wrong business, uh, running an agency. And I have yeah, no kidding. $5 million. <laughs> um, but he's used to Facebook and he's like, oh, I run a Facebook campaign. Like, you know, within a day I can call out a winner and I'm like no but if you're running it on the on the landing page it's different so yeah. the first eight tests like literally within a day like we go into the platform and he had turned them off and I'm like, I'm like what are you doing <laughs> we need to run it longer and he he would not agree finally we convinced him to run a test longer and he had a winner where he thought and then two weeks later that winner actually lost and I'm like see you know you thought yeah. it actually it matters lost. You, gotta, you gotta give it time you gotta be patient sometimes so Yes, not even sometimes. I mean, I'm sure my my team at the agency, you know, I'm sure they're tired of hearing me say, you guys, please, the ramp up period, please don't make changes, please just yeah. let it go. And really what it is, is, you know, every time you implement those changes and you don't give it the time, the length, the full, you can almost think of it like a like a baseball being thrown, you know, the, the tip of the highest point of where it goes, that's not, it doesn't fall flat there. It keeps going. And there's usually a tremendous amount that it keeps going, if not more than half. And you cut it, things off, you totally screw things up. When you pull the rug out from underneath those campaigns, when you stop that pitch, when it becomes a short stop, you know, it's, it's just not, you're, uh, you're closing your frame of mind off. So I, I love what you're saying. And I think it's vital for companies to kind of think in terms of that long-term mindset. You know, very likely you businesses and brands didn't get started to uh, close in 90 days. So why are we looking at 90 days of data? Why are we, you know, basing it on 30 days? We're here for the long-term. You want to survive for the long-term. So let's account for the long-term with what we're doing. I, I love it. I think uh, we, we might be in danger of, of going well over our hour. <laughs> There's a lot of information to unpack here. And this is something that, you know, I'm obviously very passionate about. I know that everybody at Visual Sys is passionate about, you know, optimizing the users that come in and creating value and just uh, making sure that it's, uh, it's about that user. It's about them and not what we think is right. And obviously conversion rate optimization is about using data you know, to, to give the user what they need. Exactly like you said, to open the path and, and make it easier for them to complete the action that you want them to take. 
critical. Awesome. But uh, yeah, lots, lots of good stuff covered here. Uh, if anybody would like to check out your software, FIGPI, F-I-G-P-I-I, -I, uh, definitely we'll be taking a look at that myself. Uh, we talked about a lot of snippets of information, you know, Google Optimize, Optimizely, all centered really around convert, uh, optimizing the people that are coming to the website, persuading them to take the action that they're trying to take or that we would like them to take and making it as easy as we can. So yeah, thank you for, thank you for all of your information today. Anything else you want to uh, throw at anybody uh, listening or watching before we close uh, this out? I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. Uh, and we definitely need to meet in person, by the way. Um, I, hopefully we'll yes. get opportunity to do that. Um, if anybody wants to connect, I am I hang out at LinkedIn and the land of LinkedIn. <laughs> so you can just search for my name. You, you'll you'll find me and you'll find my post there. And other, otherwise, our website is www.invesp with a P, strange name, invesp.com. So perfect. Yes, I love I love the shout out. Uh, for anybody that is is still with us or joining us, we are going to be closing off. We'll be adding this wrap up to YouTube as soon as we're done here. Uh, Sydney at the visual team does a really great job of setting up the, the Zoom recordings to be right up on YouTube right after. So want to thank you so much for your time, Khaled. Tons of information for that we all got to talk over today. Uh, we will have to meet up absolutely in person. It's so exciting to talk about meeting downtown. I tend to get a bit more tired from each social event now that I don't go to them as much. Uh, but every time, every time I, I find myself communicating with other people about the things that I love, like business, it just uh, feels like a revival in some yeah, way. Definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm looking. I'm actually doing my first conference, in-person conference in Florida. Oh wow! August, so Great. I'm looking forward to that. So today we had the first meeting to with the other speakers. I'm like, oh, haven't done this in a year and a half. It'll be fun. So. No oh, man, I love it. it. It's crazy to kind of go get thrown back into <laughs> your old life and you're somehow yes. this totally different person. But everyone feels the same way. That's for sure. <laughs> cool. Thank well, thank you, you so much. Me. Yeah, thank you so much for being on. This was an awesome conversation. I can definitely keep going for way too long. So probably a good time to, to close it off. Thanks for being on the growth series. And uh, thanks to everybody who's joined us today. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.